Uh, thank you very much, Cahirlock. Uh, Cahirlock, anybody who's voting against this bill or anybody who's advocating opposition to participation in a mechanism like this has a duty to answer one simple question. And that question is, where will they find the money, the 15 billion euro that's needed for this year to fund the difference between what we're taking in a tax and what we're spending out? That's 15 billion euro that has nothing to do with hospital, that has nothing to do with our banks. It's nothing to do with the cost of recapitalising them. It's 15 billion euro that's needed to fund the public services that this state depends on, and particularly the vulnerable citizens that Deputy Toomey touched on in his contribution. So anybody who is against mechanisms like this, against participation in a plan like this, just has to answer one simple question that this government is capable of answering, which is, where will they find 15 billion euro from? Where will they find it from for this year? Where will they find it for next year and the year after that? And that is the crux of the challenge this state is facing. The challenge that we are facing is that we cannot borrow off anybody else in the world at a rate we can afford off, a rate we can afford. So we're dealing with the lender of last resort. And if people are advocating that this state does not deal with the lender of last resort, then they have to explain elsewhere who will lend that money for, to us and who will lend it at a rate that we can afford. An additional point that has to be made um, about this mechanism is the increasing political reality that is facing leaders throughout Europe, is that while citizens who are inside bailout plans or external aid programmes, they don't want to be in them, but an increasing number of people don't want to pay for them either. If you look at the issues that are now being raised in countries like German, Germany, Finland, Holland, Austria, they're asking the question, why should they be funding a programme like this? At the very point that people who are participating in this mechanism are understandably saying, given the cost that's involved in us and the social difficulty that's involved in us, saying, well, we don't want to be in a mechanism like this. And there's a huge tension developing around that point, which will lead to some of the challenges that Deputy Toomey talked about there. Because the key point is this is that while the politics of being inside a bailout plan or an external aid programme are terrible, the economics of dealing with a default is far, far worse. Far worse. And Deputy Smith, in his own contribution, did allude, and I think he was fair to do so, to the delay that has taken place in coming up with plans to deal with all of this. And the fact that when a strategy is announced, and he's correct, within a day of that strategy being announced, criticism that has been levied by the financial markets. But two points have to be made about that. The first one is, is the sovereign crisis that people are dealing with at the moment is one of a kind when it comes to Europe. There never has been a situation where a group of countries have come together to form a monetary union that then have to deal with a sovereign debt crisis of a country within that monetary union. This is a one of a kind, brand new challenge that people are facing. And the textbook, the theory, the history that led up to this point is largely redundant when dealing with the complications and the consequences of being inside a monetary union that nobody knows how to get out of, even if they did want to get out of. And the second point that has to be made about people who are criticising the, the, the delay in dealing with the crisis here is that the people who are most vocal in levelling that delay are the banks, the financial institutions, the financial markets, all of whom lent to countries like ourselves at the same rate they were lending to Germany at. So they themselves certainly do not have a monopoly of wisdom in making those criticisms and alleging and pointing out um, to some of the issues regarding this deal. And I'll just conclude with one final point here. This state is now accessing funding at a rate that's cheaper than most of the countries who are funding this plan. And that is going to create a tension and create question marks regarding the feasibility of plans like this in the future. And that's why we must use this plan in the way it has been done at the moment, which is that it's a breathing space, it's a buffer zone, it provides insulation for us to get our house in order so that we're able to chart our way again in the future as a sovereign state. Thank you.
you just uh, 17 minutes. Uh, thank you, Lasca Hirlock, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, uh, many of my colleagues have already commented on the contribution that was made by Deputy Daly as uh, she referred to this bill. And as I was listening uh, to her contribution, I couldn't help but feel it had something of the Monty Python air all about us. When in one of their famous films, they were asking, what did the Romans ever do for us? And a similar air struck me when I heard her questioning, what was the role of foreign investment and multinational companies here in our own state? And she queried, what contribution did they make to the common good? Queried, why don't they pay any taxes? It's obviously escaped her notice that all of the employer, all of the people who work there in all of those companies all pay income tax. Their employers pay employers PRSI, all the tax that's generated in those companies pay corporation tax. And if she wants to query what contribution that kind of work makes to the common good or the national interest, she should only spend a brief few minutes having a look at the commercialisation centres that exist all over our universities in Ireland, where Irish researchers look at the technology and the research they're doing in the academic sphere and question and understand what can they do to use that research research to deliver commercial gain and to employ people and create wealth. Um, now that being said, I want to just move on to the bill itself, um, which everybody or most people have understandably welcomed, and just make four points in relation to it, Minister, um, as to points that could uh, accompany and add to the progress that's been made by the passage of a bill like this. Uh, the first one, Minister, is in relation to the supply of funds and incubation funds and seed capital that will ensure that more and more people are able to take advantage of, take advantage of and access the patent regime that's been bought here. Um, there is actually a very buoyant venture capital industry here in Ireland, but many of the sources of funding that they had been accessing into the past because of the impact of the financial crisis are currently drying up. Uh, and one of the recommendations of the Innovation Task Force report that came out, that, uh, came out last year was to look at how we could strengthen in the supply of venture capital into our state to ensure that people who are working here have access to funding to ensure they can take advantage of the cutting edge ideas that they have. And I, my understanding is that access to that funding is diminishing at the moment. And one of the ideas that is contained in our programme for government is the concept of a strategic investment bank or fund. And I would argue that the creation of something like that soon would accompany and would support the passage of measures such as this. The second point is a particular activity that was recognised by the President last year, and I'll return to the Presidency later on, uh, which was um, the creation of the International Financial, uh, the International uh, Content Clearing Centre which won an award um, from the Your Country, Your Call competition. And this is a concept and a, a, an idea that's all about what we could do to ensure that Ireland had a leading edge in the sharing and then the distribution of digital content all over the world. Um, and it's an idea that, when fleshed out, you could see could sit so well with many of the other things that we're already doing here in Ireland, and it's a concept that I would like to see supported and make sure this government is supporting across the coming years. The third point is just in relation to something we already have, which is the use of the research and development tax credit. And this is a huge strategic advantage, advantage that our state has uh, because of the creative use that we have made of that and the ability that it, the ability that it grants to companies um, to gain uh, benefits for the research and development they're doing here. And something that I believe we should look at is how we can widen the definition of how that tax credit can be used so more and more companies that are engaged in innovation can take advantage of it. And I do have a concern that looking at the application of it at the moment, it's a scheme that appears to be very accurately and very well defined to people who are working in the life sciences, in biotechnology, in pharmaceuticals, people who are wearing white coats in labs. And I would like to ensure that we do some work to make sure that anybody who's coming up with truly creative and innovative thoughts 
understands that that tax credit is available and that we do work to make sure that they're able to access it. Um, and the final point is just a point of warning um, um, in relation to the development of our patent regime. Um, while hugely supportive of um, the innovation of the creation of the right kind of patent policy here in Ireland, um, we do also need to watch out that at times the application of a patent pal policy can stifle innovation and can stifle competition. Um, and that new ideas that people may have, uh, they may be blocked from using them because of the application of patents elsewhere by other people and other firms. And it's a point of nuance, I suppose, I just signal in the context of the overwhelming and understandable support for uh, this policy and for the patent regime that we have. Um, but if, if Deputy Daly somewhat strayed off the, the theme of this uh, bill in her, well, she didn't stray off it, but her, diff, her opinions would be different to mine in terms of her contribution. It's minor in comparison to the odyssey that Deputy McGrath engaged on when he went into different matters in relation to this bill and touched on the presidency. And that was an odyssey of really uh, wonderful uh, uh, proportions. And uh, I just want to put here in the record of this House that nobody can doubt the commitment of Deputy Mitchell to the Good Friday Agreement, to constitutional nationalism and to true inclusion, and also to robust debate. But none of those things are mutually exclusive. But then again, I suppose, unlike Deputy McGrath as well, I've never been in any doubt regarding who I'm going to support. Thank you. Deputy uh, Thank you, Cahir. Look, of course, the only question that matters here is, given the aspirations that have been voiced by some colleagues over here regarding uh, the need to fund investment and the need to fund job creation, which we would share over here. The question is, where will you get the money from to do it? Uh, Deputy uh, Healy, in his own contribution, was at least honest enough to say that's the question ha that has to be answered. And he said, I'm going to answer it. And his colleagues that were sitting over there, some of them looked up at him with a mixture of worry, and others over here looked up at him with a, message of, a measure of anticipation. Because where is the money for all of this going to be found? And we heard, trotted out the answer to this. What we'll do here is we'll introduce a wealth tax here in Ireland. Let's be clear. There's no economy across Europe that's put in place a wealth tax that has not resulted in the middle classes, anybody who's owning any property, having to pay additional tax as a result of it. That's just a fact. That's the way it's implemented. And the idea that you'll bring in a, a new tax to tax wealth that's resident here in Ireland is exactly the kind of measure that will result in a further flight of deposits from our banking system that will result in taxpayers being asked to cough up more to deal with that. And if that was to happen, the people over there would be the very first people to be against a measure like that being introduced. We heard the further incoherence come from Deputy Daly. She stood up and said what we need to do is get the semi-states to fund job creation. If it was e as easy as that, why aren't they not doing that at the moment? There's two reasons they're not doing that at the moment. Firstly, they can't access and raise the funding themselves. And secondly, if they do go to markets looking to do that, they need the support and funding of the Irish state here, which is not in a position to do that. She then said, well, what we'll do is we'll fund and get uh, pension funds to do that. But you're the very people over there that are argued against and voted against the implementation of the pension levy. A pension levy which was designed to access funding from private pensions, some of which was put in there and funded and uh, um, enabled by, mortgage, by a tax reliefs, pension tax reliefs from this state. You voted against this because you said it was a raid on private pensions, yet you stand up here and say, well, that's what we want to happen. That's incoherence. And it's incoherence about a point that's too important and too serious to deal with. And this again was then illustrated then by what Deputy Boyd Barrett said. What he said is we need to go down the Greek route. We need to do what they're doing. Well, let's look at what's happening in Greece. Greece is on the, on the verge now of increasing their equivalent to VAS by three percentage points. They're just about to do it. Who'll suffer the most from that? The very people you're claiming you want to represent. Greece is on the verge of just being about to suspend 30,000 members of the public service. 30,000. 
Is that the route that Deputy Boyd Barrett wants to go down? Is that what he's advocating is the right course here for our, our state? And if it is, he should have the honesty to say that and to spell out the consequences of that. What this government instead is doing is recognising two things. The first thing we need to do is we do need to reduce the total level of stock of debt that our economy is dealing with. But let's be absolutely clear, the rhetoric here of saying the banks and the bailing out the banks is, is what's driving this. Of course it's an element to it. But the 15 billion euro deficit that this state has, that